Hello everyone, welcome to the module where we are discussing intermolecular forces and its impact on the properties of systems. We are going to continue our discussion on the impact of intermolecular forces on real gases and in this lecture we shall look at uh, what are called as Van der Waals equation and what are the different properties and what are the different caveats of it. Before we get into it, let us just refresh our memories on what we discussed in the last lecture. In the last lecture, first we had looked at what is the influence of intermolecular interactions on the properties of real gases. We had seen that there are uh, two aspects to the interaction that is one is the attractive force that is when you bring in uh, two molecules from far distance close to one another there is invariably an attraction. But if you push the molecules even further then the repulsive interaction would kick in and that would lead to uh, sort of an excluded volume effect. And this has its important consequences in the way the actually the gases behave that is how they liquefy and their behavior with respect to temperature, pressure and volume. So, in this context we had seen a term called as a compression factor which is basically nothing but a ratio of the molar volume of a real gas to that of an ideal gas and we had seen that this factor or the compression factor Z ha, uh, also depends uh, heavily on the intermolecular interactions that is it is not a flat line as it is for a ideal gas. It has its own curvatures which again capture the attractive and the repulsive part of the interaction between molecules. And taking this discussion further, we had looked at what is called as an virial equation of state where uh, the idea was to start with an ideal gas equation and modify it in such a way that one could uh, take into account the, uh, the real part or the, or, the, or the interaction between the molecules into account. And this is what we ended up with the virial equation and we are told that the virial coefficients that is B and C are do depend on temperature. However, we are mostly interested in the second virial coefficient or the second virial uh, second till the second term because third and the higher order terms are uh, generally negligible in their contribution to the pressure. So, with this we shall now try and uh, look at what another formalism to understand real gases which is called as uh, uh, Van der Waals equation of state. And let us begin by looking at this Van der Waals equation of state. So, to in order to understand this let us start again from the ideal gas equation and see how do we uh, get to this Van der Waals equation from an ideal gas equation. So, again we start with uh, PV is equal to nRT right and this is for an ideal gas. And we know that for a real gas, it has two components, one is uh, attractive interactions, attractive forces and the other is the repulsive part. All right. So, now having understood or having known these two, let us see if we can now try to uh, understand or try to modify the ideal gas equation so as to capture both the attractive as well as the repulsive parts. So, I am going to write the uh, in terms of P that is P is equal to N R T divided by V alright. And on this side I am going to draw a box which has gas molecules which are shown by these beads ok. And let us call the volume of this container as V and now you have different gas molecules around it. So, now if I were to understand the pressure of this particular let us say real system that is a gas let us say of a methane or ethane contained in a particular in, in, a, in a container. So, then let us see what, uh, what, what do I look at. So, now I have the ideal gas equation, 
However, we do know that the volume or the, the let us say molecules of methane or ethane do have a finite volume. So, they are not the vol their volume is not negligible or 0, they do have a finite volume. So, that means the this equation the ideal gas equation from that I should subtract some part of the volume which is occupied by the molecules of ethane, methane or any of the molecule to get towards a real situation. So, for that I will write minus some factor. Okay. So, that would uh, correct my volume part. Now, coming to the pressure, so if I have to actually capture the real pressure of a, of a real gas molecule such as methane or ethane, I should now start taking into account the attractive or the repulsive parts. So, now let us see what happens with these attractive or repulsive parts. So, with this there are two things which happen. One is that uh, if I actually have, if the molecules actually come together, then they would uh, attract with one another. If they let us say if these molecules are now coming together or if they are forming an attract, if they are having undergoing an association, then the force and the frequency with which they impinge on the walls that is this would decrease right compared to them being free. So, that means the attractive interaction between the two molecules actually reduces the force as well as the frequency with which the gas molecules impinge on its walls. So, again repeat it the attractive part of the interaction means that I will no, I will no longer be able to hit the uh, walls of the gas molecule with the same frequency as well as a force if it was a, if it were a ideal gas because now the sum of the molecules are actually held together and they have formed a small complex or a cluster. So, that means the pressure which will exert on the walls of a of this container would be lesser than it were for a ideal gas. So, that means I need to subtract this by some term. Let us leave this blank for the time being, but I need to subtract. I hope this uh, logic is at least clear to everyone that the volume would be the actual volume which is available for the molecules to move around would be less than the ideal volume because the gas molecules do have a finite volume that is methane, ethane or other molecules. And if you try to actually uh, push one into another, you would end up into the repulsive interactions. And this repulsive interaction means the actual volume is actually less than what is what it were for an ideal gas. That is point number one. And coming to the pressure term, what we see is that the pressure exerted by a real gas on it on the walls of a container is also lower than it if it were an ideal gas. And this is because of two reasons that is one is the force and the second one is the frequency. Frequency of impingement of gas molecules on the walls of a container. So, these both these factors that is force and the frequency get influenced if the molecules associate with one another and form a small clusters or small kind of a complexes. So, having understood that the repulsive part would lead to a reduction in the actual volume available for the gas molecule and the attractive part let us just write it here that this comes because of the attractive interaction and this comes because of the repulsive part or the repulsive forces which forces the volume cannot be 0 you will have to have a finite volume for the gas molecules. right? So, having understood this by uh, general arguments now let us try to go ahead and put some numbers or put some actual uh, values for this. Okay? So, uh, what people typically write is that P is equal to n r t divided by v minus n times b, b is a factor which actually captures the repulsion between the molecules or it is actually n b is together is what can be regarded as the volume occupied by the gas molecules. And minus a and coming to this part the attractive part let us look at these two terms now that is the force and the frequency. So, what do these two terms depend on that is the force and the frequency. 
So I hope you agree or you at least uh, see that it makes sense to say that these two quantities that is the force and, uh, and the frequency are directly proportional to the molar volume uh, to the molar concentration or the number of molecules per unit volume. In other words, it is n divided by v because if you have more number of molecules then their frequency of collision would also be more and the force would also be uh, higher. Uh, as a result, these two quantities that is force and the frequency are directly proportional to the molar concentration of the gas molecules, right? So now what we can do is since there are, these are uh, two terms which are interacting, so the, the, the net effect will be the square of it. So I would put a proportional to the constant A times n square by v square. So this entire thing can be written in a slightly different form that is P is equal to RT divided by Vm minus B minus A divided by Vm square. So I have just divided, I have divided both numerator and denominator by n and that would give me this particular expression. That is P pressure of a real gas is equal to RT divided by the molar volume minus a term called as minus a factor called as B which is a constant for a given gas and minus and this whole thing minus A which is again a constant for a given gas divided by the molar volume square. So this is what is called as the Van der Waals equation of state and A and B are the Van der Waals constants Van der Waals coefficients or Van der Waals constant for a given particular gas and what these indicate is B indicates the repulsion or the extent of repulsion and A indicates the uh, a kind of a measure for the attractiveness for a particular gas. And these are actually constants for a given gas and they do not invariably depend on temperature. So uh, a point which is important to be noted here is that this equation or this kind of uh, uh, an argument was given by uh, Johannes van der Waals in about 1875 and he did not give a rigorous proof of this expression. He took the ideal gas uh, expression or the, he took the ideal gas arguments and then he said let us say that the molecules uh, have an attractive interaction because if you bring them close together they have the, uh, they have the induced dipole induced dipole interaction and if you bring them even further then they would have a repulsive interaction. So they have a volume which you cannot uh, uh, which you cannot occupy that is the molar volume of a given uh, given gas or the volume of a given gas molecule right. So with these two simple arguments he came up with this uh, kind of a, uh, for a equation of state and this equation of state has actually stood the test of time and it is a very uh, nice way to phenomenologically explain the behavior of real gases. So I hope you appreciate that you do not have to uh, mug up or you do not have to remember anything as long as you remember that how gas molecules interact with one another. Again going back to our uh, previous analogy of uh, gas molecules being similar to human beings, if you bring if they are all separated well, uh, well separated then there would be no interaction among them or minimal interaction among them. But the moment you try to bring molecules of people together, there, together they would interact with one another. And that is what uh, would result in this uh, or would result in the, uh, in the deviation from the ideality and Van der Waals has captured this by using phenomenological arguments rather than a rigorous mathematical proof which is very important to note. So having seen the, uh, seen the equation of state or the Van der Waals equation of state, now let us go ahead and look at how does the a curve or what is the nature of this curve. So for that uh, what is done here is, uh, here is a plot or three dimensional plot of a pressure, volume and temperature. So you could uh, for the time being you could just look at one of the uh, temperature curves and neglect the others 
and what you see is that if you start looking at this temperature curve it goes up and then it sort of comes down and then finally you do not see it here because it is cut off and then it finally again comes up. And the same thing you see as you go for the high, the, the next curves as well, right. So, if you now take a two dimensional cross section of these isotherms, then one would get a graph which would look something like this, right. And if you remember from a previous lecture, we had said that, uh, that initially you would, uh, uh, the molecules would behave similar to ideal gas until a certain uh, reduction in the volume. But beyond a certain reduction, they would actually sort of undergo a liquefaction because of the attractive forces between them and that would result in a flat line, correct? And finally, once you have all the liquid and if you try to again further reduce the volume, that would lead to a, a repulsion because you cannot compress the liquid beyond a certain point. So, that is the picture what we had in the, uh, in, the in the last lecture. If you now look at the this particular uh, let us say the P versus V diagram which you get out of Van der Waals equation, it looks slightly different. So, you again start at a higher volume, you uh, keep decreasing the volume and then the pressure goes up which is normal and then at a certain juncture it actually as you reduce the volume, the pressure actually goes down and then it comes up which is a bit of an anomaly. So, I will just try and point that out to you so that to make it more clear. Okay. So, if we, uh, if we try and take a look at the, this particular graph, we have come uh, here the volume has been reduced starting from the here till here, right. So, you st still keep reducing the volume, the pressure goes up, but from here and beyond what you do is as you reduce the volume, you also see a drop in the pressure which is actually counterintuitive or you do not expect that, right. So, this is where actually the, uh, the Van der Waals equation of the state does not capture the real behavior completely well that it has a deviation from the uh, what one would expect for a real gas because if it were a real gas you would expect it to be remain constant something like this. However, here the Van der Waals equation predicts a drop in the pressure with a decrease in the volume which is counterintuitive. To uh, rectify this, people have come up with what are called as Maxwell's lines or they have just drawn some horizontal lines such that let us say if I take this particular curve here, I will use a different ink now. Say if I take this particular curve, so what people have done is they, uh, they draw horizontal line here so that an equal portion is above the curve and an equal portion is below. So, as to sort of nullify the, uh, the whole effect which the Van der Waals equation predicts. So, this is a bit of un, uh, unrealistic or unphysic uh, or a, a situation which does not take place in the real world with real gases that is a drop in the pressure with decreasing volume. So, to account for that you draw these kind of lines which are called as Maxwell's lines and this is used to uh, do, a rec uh, do a correction to the Van der Waals equation. All right. So, now uh, let us go ahead and try to look at what are the main characteristic uh, features of this uh, Van der Waals equation. So, I will again uh, rewrite the Van der Waals equation so that we all remember what we are talking about that is the P is equal to RT divided by Vm minus B minus A divided by Vm square. Okay. So, I hope everyone remembers this and once we have this particular equation, so then the following features become pretty obvious that is the first one is at high temperature and at a very large molar volume, then the equation should or equation tend towards an ideal gas. That is let us say if I have a, if I have the temperature term which is pretty high that means this term the first term would be very high and if the molar volume Vm is also very very high or we are looking at a very large volume then the then the second term actually becomes vanishingly small compared to the first. So, then this work equation would tend towards P is equal to RT divided by Vm with the B factor being very small com in comparison to Vm that is if Vm is much much bigger than B, 
right? That is what we are talking about. That VM is very very large. So in in other words, the Van der Waals equation of state can actually be also be used to describe in the limiting cases the ideal gas equation. That is when the temperature is very high and the molar volume is also very large. And the second important feature of the Van der Waals equation is uh, it shows the existence of the liquids and the gases in what are called as Van der Waals loops or if you just to refresh your memories I hope you remember in this I will just draw a small curve here volume versus P we had this these kind of curves and we had called them as Maxwell's lines this is Maxwell line. Maxwell line and, and these are what are called as the these are what are called as Van der Waals loops. So, these loops actually predict or at least tell us about the coexistence of gas and liquid. So, this is very similar to what we saw even for the uh, even in the last lecture where going from the uh, going till the if you remember the uh, the letters we had going from C to E there was a complete liquefaction which was taking place from E onwards the liquid was incompressible so you had a huge rise in the temperature you had a huge rise in the pressure correct so this is very similar to that and the third and the most important uh, uh, the point is that the Van der Waals equation of state can also be used to derive what are called as uh, critical constants in terms of the Van der Waals coefficients. So, I will just try and uh, explain that to you in a minute. So, if you again take this particular uh, kind of an expression or let me try and draw it here a small one. So, if I Okay, if you have a, a point where actually the uh, if you have along the PV curve a point where actually you do not have the uh, or the liquid and the gaseous coexistence line actually coincide or they become into they merge into a single point and then it goes up then this one would call it as a critical point or the TC or the or the volume as VC and the pressure as PC. The, the corresponding component that is the temperature pressure and the volume are called as critical temperature, uh, critical volume and critical pressure. So, at this uh, uh, let us say at this line if you now take the derivative and the double derivative you they should both equate to 0 and if you use just use that uh, the this mathematical uh, statement that is at this critical temperature and pressure and volume the Van der Waals equation of state or the first and the second derivative of Van der Waals equation can be equated to 0 then just by doing a bit of algebra you can end up on these terms that is the Vc and the Pc and the Tc in terms of the Van der Waals coefficients that is A, B and the universal gas constant R. So, this is a very uh, uh, useful way to actually calculate the uh, the critical constant for a given gas and also to actually check back or to uh, go back and look at the Van der Waals coefficient which you obtain for a given system are they actually correct based on the experimental measure measurement of the critical constant that is temperature, pressure and volume. Alright, so now we have looked at uh, what are the different uh, features of the Van der Waals equation of state and we also talked a bit about the critical temperatures and the critical volumes. So, now let us go ahead and look at this in a little more detail what are these critical uh, temperatures, pressure and volume mean. So, to understand that uh, again let us go back to the pressure volume graphs. So, I hope you remember that we start at a very high volume and then we as we start compressing then the at a certain point you at around point G you have a li liquefaction which starts taking place and that continues till F and from there on it is the liquid becomes incompressible right. And in between the G and F you always have a coexistence of the gas and the liquid. 
And this is what I tried to draw in the previous graph where you have a what Van der Waals equation predicts are these dotted lines and the shaded areas are called as Van der Waals loops. So, if you now keep on changing the temperature that is if you keep on recording that at uh, various temperatures because these are isotherms. So, this is at let us say T1 and this is at T2 and this is at uh, say T3 and you see a point where these two the G and the F actually come back and merge to this K right. And this is the point which is called as a TC where the where uh, where both the liquefaction uh, is complete at the single point and the, this is what is called as a critical temperature and the corresponding pressure and the volume are called as the critical uh, pressure and the critical volume. All right, And this can be represented in a slightly different way in what are called as PT phase diagrams or a pressure and temperature phase diagrams where you have a temperature on the x axis. And let us just try and look at this part that is you have a vapor and a liquid phase because that is what we are trying to do. You go from a gas to the vapor phase to the liquid phase and what you see is that beyond a certain point you have what is called as a critical point and here and beyond, beyond this pressure and temperature here what is one calls it as a supercritical fluid or a state in which the properties of the system are in between those of a liquid and a gas. And so you must be wondering what is this uh, sort of enigmatic uh, term he is calling it as a supercritical fluid. So the, uh, the main uh, idea of the importance is that the properties of this particular state which is called a supercritical fluid are somewhere in between those of a pure liquid and a pure gas. So, what that means is that you can actually have a, uh, you can make use of both the properties and you use it in some sort of an application. To give you a feel for the applications, if you uh, think of carbon dioxide and if you take a look at the critical temperature and pressures of carbon dioxide, the critical temperature is around 31 degree C and the critical pressure is about uh, 72 atmosphere. So, by now varying the pressure you can go to this critical uh, supercritical fluid phase and in this supercritical fluid phase you have a entirely different properties. And the properties are they have very different solubilities, they have very different uh, uh, let us say densities and this can be made use to extract different materials uh, in a mixture. For example, if you have a, a, a coffee beads and if you are trying to extract caffeine out of it actually using a supercritical carbon dioxide is a very uh, very benign and a sustainable way to actually extract caffeine out of uh, the coffee beans and and also by just playing around with the pressure one can selectively extract different components so that's the reason why the, a lot of uh, technological importance and relevance is given to supercritical fluids and I hope this convinces you or at least gives you a flavor of why one should study the supercritical phenomena or the supercritical fluids. So, with this uh, we shall stop our discussion here and in the next class we shall look at uh, potential energy diagrams and what do they tell us about bonding in uh, molecular systems. Thank you.